a talk titled Ingrained Habit, the Kitchen Cars and the Transformation of Post-War Japanese Society and Identity. Um, so uh, we will be starting this webinar in about a couple minutes. Um, I, I, I saw some um, from my Modern Japan uh, class. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Um, and um, so this core, uh, this, this uh, talk is very relevant uh, of, uh, to the Modern Japan course. Um, uh, for those of you who are taking my course, um, you know that now we are talking about, this week is, is about uh, um, the um, post-war Japan in the 70s and, and 80s. Um, um, but it's still re very relevant. Um, you know, um, one point I made, you know, you know, of course, is that um, post-war Japan, by and large, was a, a creation of the United States, um, and in the context of the Cold War, right? Um, so, you know, unavoidably, Japan and U.S. has, a, you know, very close relationship with each other. Um, so we are fortunate to have Dr. Hobson um, today to, um, you know, illustrate this. Um, you know, influence from the U.S. on Japan um, through the pers perspective field. That's um, a very exciting topic. Okay, um, so uh, let me get started. Um, hello everyone, um, I'm um, Professor Lu. Um, I'm a social professor um, at, uh, at Michigan State University Department of History. Um, today, um, I'm honored um, to have the opportunity to introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Nathan Hobson, um, who uh, is um, associate professor um, at uh, Nagoya University, um, and he is a specialist of Japanese and East Asian history, um, and also uh, the chair of Japan in Asia Cultural Studies Program. He is currently working on a um, manuscript on the social history of nutrition science in modern Japan as a technology of nation building, focusing on uh, school feeding and the government-led nutritional activism as its central case studies. And his first book, Ennobling uh, in Japan's Savage Northeast, Tohoku as Post-War Thought, uh, provides the first comprehensive account in English of the discursive life of the Tohoku region within post-war Japan. Uh, Dr. Hobson's uh, topic today uh, is titled Ingrained Habits, the Kitchen Cars and the Transformation of Post-War Japanese Diet and Identity. Um, so before I give the floor to Dr. Hobson, um, I want to uh, let you know that um, this is a webinar um, and you're encouraged to uh, type in your comments and questions uh, even during the talk uh, if you like. Um, in particular, Dr. Hobson would like to interact with you um, um, uh, during the talk. So uh, feel free to type in um, you know, your comments in the Q&A. If you scroll down to the bottom um, of uh, your screen, you will see the Q&A button. And click it and you can type in there. Um, just now I saw someone ask a question, will a recording of this lecture be available after? Um, I don't think so. Um, but, um, yes, 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 oh, yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, okay. So now we have an official answer. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, but we, I, I think this is available upon request. Um, perhaps I'll be able to ask Julia um, for that link so that I will share it with you. Um, yes, yes. A media, space, that a media space link. I'll get, get it to you. Okay. Is that okay with you, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Hobson? 
Oh, of course. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So, see, your question is answered. So feel free to type your <laughs> questions uh, during, um, during the talk as well. Um, okay. Um, now, please allow me to give the floor to Dr. Hobson. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Liu, uh, and thank you for uh, both the kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to do this lecture. Um, and thank you to everybody who is in attendance. Um, so before I uh, do a little bit of uh, screen sharing and share my PowerPoint uh, with you, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of where the uh, project comes from. Um, and uh, how I'm situating it within uh, the book manuscript uh, project that Professor Liu mentioned a moment ago. Uh, so my larger research project is, uh, as Professor Liu said, a social history of nutrition science uh, in modern Japan. So what I'm interested in is not nutrition science in the laboratory, but how nutrition science in the laboratory gets out of the laboratory and interacts with society uh, and sort of what it does there uh, and how people, um, both you know, specialists and non-specialists um, are interacting with the ideas behind nutrition science and how that's affecting uh, history and society. So my primary and sort of original uh, case study for this was the Japanese school lunch program. Um, and I was very interested in the ways that the school lunch program, um, it's in a very literal sense, uh, building Japanese people. Um, and I was interested in the, and I still am, uh, interested in the ways that uh, the school lunch program um, is both creating the bodies and the sort of, in a sense, a sort of national character uh, for, Jap for Japan, because something like 98 or 99 percent of um, Japanese school children, uh, elementary school children, and it's something somewhere still above 90 percent, more like 95 percent of middle school children, uh, are participating in a school lunch program that is very, uh, certainly compared to the United States, very uh, regimented, I guess, is maybe the way to put it. Um, and there's a lot of, it's, a, it's a, an almost universally shared experience uh, that people have. And so, but it's also, the, the meals are planned by professional nutritionists. Uh, again, somewhat, somewhat unlike the way that meals are, are planned in American uh, school cafeterias. So I was very interested in how this might uh, sort of affect the way that people grow up and see themselves in relation to food uh, and uh, how that fits into this sort of picture of uh, what Japan is um, as, a, as a country, as a nation. Um, and out of that project uh, came the, the talk that I'm going to do today, which is actually about another aspect of uh, the interaction of uh, nutrition uh, with uh, Japan in, uh, in this case, in the post-war. Um, and you'll see that there, it's sort of a parallel uh, talk in a sense. Um, and I'll try and explain how it fits uh, specifically into uh, this overall project as we go forward. So I want to start off uh, here sharing my screen with you. Um, and again, uh, as uh, Professor Liu said, if you would like to um, type in your questions in the Q&A window uh, while we're going, that's great. In fact, I'm going to ask you to do that uh, on the next slide, uh, because I want to start off by asking you about uh, this photograph. If I can actually, I'm sorry, my PowerPoint is having a, a little bit slow today. So let me see if it's going to cooperate. There we go. Okay. Um, so the title of the talk includes this kitchen car. Uh, so I thought it would be a good idea to start off with a picture of one. Um, and 
if anybody would like to uh, answer in the Q&A, that, that would be great. But I'd love to know sort of what you see here. What's remarkable about this picture, if anything? Um, what are we looking at that strikes you? And let me give you a little bit of background while you're, while you're thinking about that. And please feel free to go ahead and uh, answer as I'm talking. Um, so this is a kitchen car, which is going to be the subject of our talk. And uh, this is a quite a sort of typical scene that you, that, uh, you would have seen in uh, 1950s and 1960s Japan. Um, so that's the era that we're looking at. I think this is a, a, around 1960, um, according to the archival, uh, the archive that I got this photograph from. Is there anybody who sees anything striking that uh, sticks out at you? Anything interesting that we should pay attention to? Transportational food available to the public. Yes, so the interesting thing about this is that um, when we talk about the uh, kitchen car in, in, or kitchen car in Japan now, really it's, um, it refers to the sort of phenomenon of the food truck, right? Um, and that's actually not what it is here. Uh, it becomes that, but the way this starts out, they're not actually selling the food. Um, if anything, they're selling the nutrition uh, so that the people inside the truck, uh, and this is a, it's a bus, as you can see, are professional nutritionists. And the people lined up around are actually essentially having a class in nutrition. Um, and we'll see how that works out. But these, uh, you can see that it's primarily, uh, although not exclusively, um, old, uh, uh, middle-aged women um, in, from, and, and let's say, you know, women from, let's say, their 30s to 50s or 60s, and then a couple of old, mostly older men and children, um, because this is happening during the daytime when a lot of uh, fathers are off at work. Um, and these buses would just pull up uh, into, uh, you know, town squares, uh, by big apartment complexes, etc. around, all around Japan. And they would give these free nutrition classes where they demonstrated how to cook uh, good food for your family. There's a lot to this, though, that I want to unpack in today's presentation. Um, and I want to, the next thing I want to do is show you a brief video. Uh, it's about a minute and a half. Uh, it's in Japanese, but I think you'll be able to get the picture. Or no, I'm sorry, I think this is actually, uh, yeah, this one is, is in Japanese, but I think you'll be able to get the picture. This is also from uh, an area of rural Japan. Um, and you'll see one of these uh, kitchen cars at work. Uh, again, if, if my PowerPoint cooperates, and I'm sorry, it is, it is a little slow today. Oh, let's try that one more time. Okay, so it's clearly not cooperating, but uh, I, you can maybe get a little bit of the picture uh, of what's going on. Um, so let's try to unpack the, the history behind this. Um, does anybody, by the way, recognize this quote? Um, if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. Now? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> that's a good guess, actually. Um, although uh, it's it's quite a different source. Uh, this is actually Proverbs uh, from the Bible. This is uh, Proverbs okay. uh, twenty five twenty one. Um, but it, it's an interesting it's an interesting quote because uh, this is in a in a in, uh, both in a sort of larger sense and in a very sort of uh, direct sense, uh, what American part of what American policy toward Japan was in the post-war, um, as Japan became not the enemy but was still hungry, uh, one of the things that the U.S. did was to give Japan bread to eat, uh, and this was not a matter of sort of charity as such. Uh, it was a matter of uh, national policy and international relations. And so the kitchen cars featured very prominently in this uh, Japanese-American uh, history of relations, as well as in the post-war recovery of Japan. So the first thing is uh, the kitchen cars are, they have two names in Japanese. They are both referred to as kitchen car, but also uh, eiyo shidousha, uh, which so literally is uh, nutrition guidance cars. Uh, and you can see a photograph, uh, a sort of close up uh, that uh, is similar to uh, the, 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 sorry, it's a, it's a close up of that larger photo that we had, right? So the same from the same presentation. And you can see there's uh, a nutritionist there actually making food that people, and you can see people are gathered around to uh, watch and learn. So this presentation is going to explore the history and the politics of these American funded uh, kitchen cars. And that's really a key point. Um, these cars are, these kitchen cars are funded by the United States for the, the years of 1954 to 1960. Um, and I want to look at sort of the, the, uh, the aftermath, the sort of post history of that period as well. But I'm going to focus at first on this period, 1956, to, excuse me, 1956 to 1960. Um, and the kitchen cars are operating in an overlap of nutrition science, um, commerce, domestic and international politics, et cetera. And so they encapsulate the ways that uh, Japanese and U.S. relations were very complex and entangled with each other um, in the post-war, as well as I want to touch a little bit on the sort of post-war um, Japanese domestic politics of economic and social rebuilding. So, uh, as I said, this is related to my larger project about uh, school lunches, and that's because the kitchen cars were part of a two-pronged American strategy uh, toward Japan when it came to food in the, in the early post-war years. Uh, the U.S., as I said, funded the cars, the fuel, the labor, the ingredients uh, that were required to operate the kitchen cars from 56 to 60. Uh, they introduced a lot of new foods and ingredients to audiences around Japan, and they became, along with the school lunch program, one of the two most important tools for marketing American farm products in Japan. Um, and if you think about it, the two programs have a kind of natural synergy. Right? So on the one hand, children uh, at school are taught to like bread and milk, because those are two of the foods that are being uh, those are the sort of center of an American sponsored uh, school lunch program. And the, they learn to like bread and milk. And then as one American report put it, they ask for it at home on days when they're not in school. And what that means then is that you have to teach their mothers uh, who for better and worse are responsible for most of the cooking to then uh, both cook with wheat, soy, corn, dairy, meat, et cetera, these American farm products, um, and to do, do it in such a way that it's at least can be seen as, uh, and we'll talk about this too, uh, beneficial, right? So economical, nutritious, rational, scientific, et cetera. So with the school lunch program, uh, the express mission of that program is to transform the, the, the Japanese national diet 
Um, and the kitchen car program is sort of the, the other side of that. Um, US sources are quite unequivocal and blunt about this. Um, and this is a quote from one of them. Uh, the goal of the kitchen car program is, quote, to expand the consumption of wheat in Japan. Uh, and to provide Japanese adults at the community level with information on balanced diets, emphasizing the need for inclusion of wheat um, for both their, uh, for them and their children. And so with this in mind, each of these demonstrations included at least one wheat dish. And they used slogans such as flour-based food once a day, uh, ichi ikkai funshoku wo, uh, to promote wheat. Uh, to post-war Japanese. Uh, in 1958, uh, remember the program starts in 56, and in 1958 the American Soybean Association joins in, uh, and this is when it gets a little bit more diverse and you start to see soy recipes as well. Um, ultimately, these programs, I, I, I would argue quite strongly um, that they contribute significantly to Japan's post-war dietary transformation, uh, which is often summed up as westernization. Um, and for this reason, there are certainly a lot of uh, places on the internet where you can go to find conspiracies uh, about the uh, ways that the United States destroyed the traditional Japanese diet, etc. And I want to argue it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's not that I want to dismiss that out of hand, um, but I think it's a little bit more complicated. And one of the things that that misses is uh, the difference between a short-term and a long-term perspective. Um, my, my point is that in the short run, this was a win-win, right? So on the one hand, with, for Japan, malnutrition and hunger were still extremely pressing problems in the 50s and even into the 60s uh, for many people uh, across the country. So the kitchen cars are teaching uh, Japanese, and again, it is women, how to cook cheap, nutritious, pretty easy things to improve the health of their families and to sort of kickstart the economy uh, and help the nation get back on track. Uh, the Japan Nutrition Association, which operates the kitchen cars in Japan with American funding, describes them as uh, mobile education centers, teaching Japan's housewives to prepare, as they put it, bargain wheat meals to fit into present food habits. But of course, they're actually, those aren't present food habits. They're being created by the kitchen cars. Nevertheless, uh, bureaucrats, politicians, nutritionists, and the medical establishment in Japan welcomed the kitchen cars as a tool to teach rational, efficient, nutritious cooking uh, as a foundation for economic growth and recovery and Japan's sort of international resurgence. Now, on the other hand, encouraging Japan to consume more wheat was a pressing issue for the United States. Uh, and there's a couple reasons for this. So on the one hand, the U.S. Uh, has this massive domestic surplus that it needs to get rid of uh, somehow, um, because Japan, the, the U.S. had really ramped up uh, production uh, during the war of all sorts of agricultural commodities to help feed the allies. And you can't then suddenly at the end of the war say, hey, guys, stop making food. Um, Farmers are an important political and economic constituency. Uh, and so you need to find a, a way to use this surplus, right? And one way that, that the US used that surplus was to help allies around the world, uh, Japan being the one that we're talking about, uh, recover and develop economically um, and uh, sort of under this US Cold War umbrella. And for, the, for Japan in particular, uh, and this was true from the beginning, there was always this sense that Japan would also in the future become a wealthy uh, market for, for the future for American farm products. So, right, so this might be sort of short run, we might be selling things on the cheap, uh, but in the long run, this would be beneficial uh, as a market development tool. Um, so this is, this is why in the short run, it does seem to be uh, very much a win-win a in this sense. And that's why in addition to supporting the economic recovery and political stability of this Cold War ally, Japan, the kitchen cars uh, were instrumental in teaching Japan to accept and consume American uh, farm produce. 
So um, I said we're going to focus on 56 to 60 because that's the, the period of the actual program, but 1954 is a pivotal year for two reasons. Uh, so PL 480, this is public law 480, um, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And the other is the OWGL, this is the Oregon Wheat Growers League. So the Oregon Wheat Growers League sends a uh, fact-finding mission, essentially, uh, to Japan for the first uh, for the first time, and this is the beginning of the uh, what becomes the kitchen car program. So, let's talk about uh, PL four eighty. Um, some of you may know this from studying uh, American history uh, in the post-war. This is actually a, a photograph from Europe because it was not just something that uh, a law that affected Japan. Um, PL 480 was a watershed in the history of American food aid, um, separating a sort of an era of you know, ad hoc, sort of charitable, time-limited responses to from an era from 1954 on excuse me, in which food aid is a, uh, a tool to help conduct the foreign policy of the United States. So it's intended to promote uh, American agricultural security and stability, uh, international trade in American agricultural commodities, um, and also to bolster the economic development of Cold War American allies and friendly nations. It became the central pillar of post-war American food aid especially as a tool of economic and foreign, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, policy. So there's sort of four uh, main components to the law, and we only have to look at number one for today, uh, which is that the United States uh, says that it will accept foreign currency, in this case, yen, as payment for agricultural commodities, which normally you'd have to buy in, um, in dollars. Uh, the important thing here, right, is that Japan doesn't have foreign currency reserves at the end of the war. Uh, and so allowing Japan to pay in yen uh, allow, is, is a way for um, Japan to be able to, to, to do these transactions. At the same time, Yen is useless to the United States. So what they actually do is loan back the money that Japan pays, right? At extremely low um, interest rates with these long-term development loans. And so more or less, Japan is getting free food or pretty close to it, right? They pay in yen. The U.S. then loans back that money at 1% or 2% on a 30-year loan. Um, and the thing is that has to be the, that money then has to be earmarked for economic development projects. So Japan gets free food and it has to develop infrastructure uh, and other things to develop its economy. So in this sense, it's clearly for Japan a big plus. And what's the United States getting out of it? Well supporting a political ally, very important, and developing a long-term market. So let's uh, think about how this plays out uh, domestically in Japan, in addition to those things that I've talked about. Um, from 1952, when Japan uh, regains its sovereignty uh, after the, uh, the, the war is officially ended, the occupation is officially ended, um, Japan goes on this uh, campaign, I guess you would call it, of Eiyo Kaizen, uh, nutritional improvement. Um, and the most important person here is Oiso Toshio. He'll, he'll return a couple of times uh, in our presentation today. Um, he works at the uh, health ministry um, and he worked uh, with the Americans uh, during the occupation. He's probably the, in, in many ways, the most important nutritionist of his time. He had been head of the, uh, the National Nutrition uh, Laboratory earlier in his career. Um, and he believes that wheat is superior to rice. Um, he's not the only one uh, who believes this at the time, but it's important that the man who, uh, as George Solt noted, was, quote, responsible for guiding the dietary habits of the population of Japan, uh, 
was motivated by concerns that rice, the rice-based Japanese diet was poor in nutrition um, and that, that wheat was a better food and that it was a, that was demonstrably true because clearly the wheat-eating nations of the world were the powerful nations of the world and that rice-eating Asian nations were weak, including Japan. Um, and so his own experience uh, as a nutritionist, as well as somebody who experienced Japan's defeat in war, seems to have shaped this view. Um, and Oiso is the person who, there's, there's a little bit of controversy about whether it's actually his idea, uh, but he seems to be the person who sort of gets this program started by uh, suggesting it to the Americans. Um, because they're ideally suited in his mind to this campaign for nutritional improvement. So the other thing that I wanted, that I just wanted to mention um, is of course the school lunch program, which starts in 1947, uh, Gakko Kyushoku. Uh, and the, the, this has already started in 47. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, it's primarily, uh, bread, milk, and then it's up to the individual schools what they serve with that. And that bread and milk is already being supplied uh, by the United States, of course, because it's 1947. This is during the occupation period. So um, every, you know, uh, so it's an occupation run program. Um, but and the occupation nutritionists believed that milk was basically the perfect food, right, nutritionally, um, and that bread uh, was, a, uh, was what went with that, um, and it was also what America could supply for Japan uh, at the time, as a, essentially to uh, keep Japan from starving. So this is what's already going on in the context here, and the school lunch program continues to be bread milk, and then something on the side until the 70s, actually. So there's a whole generation of Japanese who grows up um, with nothing, with, with everyday uh, school lunches being um, just bread and milk, uh, you know, with maybe like a soup or something on the side. So this is, this is where we are uh, when the when we get into the 1950s and Americans are looking at the school lunch program and saying, wow, there's like six million Japanese school children who are now eating uh, American bread and drinking American milk. That's a huge market. And there's six million more who aren't at that point. Wow, that's even more. And if we can make them like bread and milk, they'll be future consumers for us. Uh, and so how do we expand that? And that's how you get um, American missions being sent to Japan to sort of fact find. At the same time, um, you have the, the uh, Americans coming to Japan for the first time in the 50s with this in mind. Uh, you already have um, a, a, a kind of a yoshidosha, a kind of kitchen car. This is the, the Tokyo's, uh, Tokyo's original uh, one, um, which debuts uh, on January 16th of 1954. Um, and this is uh, actually a, a, a project of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government to go around to all of the schools and make sure that they are getting the proper instruction on how to make the school lunches, right? Now, Oiso looks at this and he says, wait a minute, why are we just teaching the schools when we could be teaching the, the regular sort of housewives and mothers of Japan, and this is more sort of his language, this is the way he talks. Um, so it's kind of a proof of concept to him that if you could deploy this kind of uh, mobile nutrition education center um, throughout Japan, then with proper funding, of course, and preferably from the United States, because Japan doesn't have the money, then the kitchen cars could be as effective as the school lunch program in promoting wheat consumption in Japan, which again is a win-win in his mind. And this is why uh, the American representative from Oregon uh, who does these uh, initial missions, a guy named Richard Baum, uh, describes Oiso as, quote, the best friend we have in Japan for increasing consumption of wheat foods. So 
when the U.S. Uh, begins to sponsor the um, the kitchen car program in 1956, there are uh, eight buses, uh, and they're run by the Japan Nutrition Association. They officially debut in October of 1956. Uh, and these are just some specs of what they uh, what what they were like. They were manufactured by Nissan, um, and so there's eight initially. Um, four additional buses are added in 1958 for a total of 12. Uh, they cost uh, three and a half million yen each, uh, which was a substantial sum, uh, as, although a lot less in dollars than it was in yen because it was 360 yen to the dollar. Um, and the kitchen cars were uh, staffed by teams of professional nutritionists, and they were supported by local public health officials. Uh, they were also a sort of a part of a larger campaign uh, for nutrition improvement with uh, workshops, exhibits, seminars, and there was a publicity blitz in uh, movies, radio, magazines, posters, pamphlets, leaflets. There were even uh, kamishibai, these sort of paper theater uh, street corner entertainments, also magic lanterns. I had to look up what that was, uh, but this was a, a thing as well. Um, to support the health ministry's campaign of national nutritional improvement. Uh, and these 12 kitchen cars um, were essentially loaned out to each of Japan's prefectures. And they sort of went around all over the place in all the prefectures to try and reach everybody. Um, so by the summer of 1957, the, the initial fleet of eight had already traveled 73,300 kilometers um, and had given 2,500 demonstrations to over a quarter million Japanese women. By the end of the program in 1960, it's 570,000 kilometers um, at 20,000 locations. Now, primarily they're rural areas, but they also go um, to these new suburban uh, danchi, these housing projects that are going up, um, and some in the cities as well. So let's take a look uh, at actually, uh, this is uh, a photograph that I showed you earlier. Um, this is the full photograph. So I wanna sort of focus in on this. So there's a couple of things that I think are really interesting about this. I, I, should, I should say before we get into that though, by the way, that uh, one of the nutritionists, uh, or at least one of, the, one of the people in the white lab coats that say, hello, I have authority, um, is a man. And I chose this uh, photo because it's unusual. Uh, and I suspect he's not a nutritionist, but rather somebody from the local public health center. Uh, it, it, I'm not sure about this. I wasn't able to track this down. But most of the nutritionists, the professional nutritionists, were women. Um, and uh, that's something I've written about elsewhere. Uh, and if we want to talk about that in the Q&A, we can. Um, but in any case, so they're mostly women. And you can see that the audience is almost exclusively women uh, and some children. Um, is there anything that, that jumps out at you here about the, the setup, the food, the audience, um, anything that strikes you? If, you? if there is, you can drop it in the uh, Q&A. And thank you, Matthew. I do see your second question, or your, sorry, your question there. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. Well, I think, I think you can sort of, see, uh, maybe the answer is here for you, right? Um, that they, they themselves are Japanese. Yeah. Uh, how are the consumers? That, oh. William, you've asked a fantastic question, um, and we will definitely be getting to that. Uh, but I don't want to spoil the ending here. Um, so th this is this is a spoiler alert question. Um, so let me talk about this this photograph specifically. Uh, so one of the things that's interesting to me is you can see a lot of the women are taking notes, right? And while this does not necessarily mean that they all went home and you know made the recipe, made th these foods right uh, themselves that day or even that week or whatever. It does suggest that they're receptive to these ideas, um, and that they're interested and are at least willing to try. Um, and the aggregate effect, right, uh, of doing this, you know, for literally millions of people, you know, 20,000 times all over Japan, um, it has a significant effect in changing or shaping the way that people understand what good food is. Um, the other thing is, uh, th there's two things I want to say about the foods themselves. One is you can see uh, right where the, the kanji are, uh, there's a little basket of noodles. Um, and these are probably soba noodles, I'm guessing, uh, but which is buckwheat, right? Buckwheat noodles. Uh, but 
even those have wheat in them. Um, it's very unusual to find uh, buckwheat noodles that are 100% buckwheat. They actually, they're not that great. Uh, most people don't like them very much. And so a lot of them are, you know, uh, almost half uh, uh, wheat. And so this, even this, which doesn't look like it, is a way to promote American wheat. The other thing is uh, the uh, woman has it looks like that's um, lotus root that she's uh, sauteing up there. Um, and this is also a way of promoting American produce. Not lotus root, because the US is not exporting lotus root to Japan. It's the oil. Um, it's either corn, or, corn oil or soy oil, right? So the whole idea of sauteing and frying things uh, to, using oil to get more efficiently get calories and to also uh, get fat soluble vitamins like vitamin K and vitamin E um, into the Japanese diet. This was another part of how uh, the positive nutritional benefits were explained to Japanese people. Um, and so actually frying and sauteing, which were not common in Japan um, in the pre-war period, uh, were a big part of the um, sort of selling this as a, a new modern way to cook and a rational and efficient way to cook. Um, there's more to it though. Uh, and by the way, this I should say, um, I owe a, a great debt to Dr. Liu for fishing this out of the Michigan State Archives for me. Uh, this, was, this is a uh, diagram uh, that was produced uh, in Japan by the Japan Nutrition Association uh, for the American sponsors of the Kitchen Car program and said, hey, here, this is just part of a larger pamphlet. Um, but you can see uh, what the interior of the bus looks like. So we've been looking mostly at the right side of this, which is the back of the bus. Uh, and you can see there's, a, there's two gas burners um, and what they call a cooking table, which is essentially the countertop area, right? Um, and there's a sink. Uh, and then these counters, which are sort of folded out that people were around there. Um, and you can see they have an ice box, in other words, a primitive refrigerator in a sense, um, et cetera. Uh, so this is what the, the interior of these buses looked like. And this was a, a pretty standard plan uh, for all of them. And the, what's interesting about the uh, uh, kitchen cars is they have a, a lot of um, advantages over something like a, um, a, a health center or a public hall or something like that, right? Because you don't need to, to reserve and set up a venue. Um, you can just start whenever people show up. Uh, it's a low commitment for the people. They don't have to buy tickets. They don't have to, you know, get dressed up. Um, they can just kind of come. Um, and that's actually something that the Japanese sources talk about a lot is that people can come in their fudangi, in their regular clothes. Um, especially outside Tokyo, it means that, uh, you know, a lot of rural areas are very, very far from these sort of big public venues, uh, and it's hard for them to travel. So there's time restrictions, cost restrictions, right? So with the kitchen cars, you go to them. Um, it's also casual, intimate, right? It makes it easier for audience members to ask questions, and they did, um, and to interact. Uh, then they're also, you know, it's easy to publicize them because you have the cooperation of local uh, health officials. Uh, women's groups, PTAs also got involved, uh, and local governments. And last, um, because they're equipped with these state-of-the-art kitchens, um, in addition to using uh, new ingredients and techniques and nutritional knowledge, right, so specialized nutritional knowledge, by doing so, they're exposing rural residents to um, a kind of American bright life, uh, which is a big sort of part of, of, of the uh, post-war ethos in a sense. And I want to look at that specifically um, in the next set of pictures here. So uh, let's take a look at the middle and right picture first before we go back to the left. I guess I should have put them in the other order, come to think of it. But um, so these, the, the picture in the center and on the right are uh, examples of these uh, sort of shiny, new, chrome-plated, uh, you know, electric kitchens that are being, uh, this is actually, these are actually photos from inside uh, the kitchen cars, by the way. So they, they look very much like the uh, kitchens that are being installed in the newest apartments in Japan. Um, and so it's kind of a showcase for this modern kitchen and the modern kitchen technology. Um, and if you're familiar with the word akogare, which is uh, in Japanese, sort of a longing for something, right? A desire for something. Um, this was the sort of akogare no kitchen, the, the, the kitchen that everybody wanted or longed for. Um, and so it was being sort of 
associated with this food, right, in a positive way. Um, and what you see over on the left is actually something uh, really interesting for me. Um, what we are, so we're looking from the perspective of the audience. Uh, and what you're doing is you're looking sort of up. Instead of looking straight at the nutritionist, if you're standing in the back of the audience, you can't really see what's happening um, you know, on the gas burners. So what they did was they installed a mirror so that you could sort of see down into the, uh, uh, you know, in, into the kitchen to cooking area. Um, and this is a reminder that this was really a matter of performance and spectacle, right? On the one hand, yes, it is about um, nutritional knowledge and, you know, and those sorts of things, but really it's a lot about just the, the, the power of the performance. Um, and that it was really important for people to see these things happening themselves. It's also a lot like, you know, a cooking show on TV, which is something we'll come back to a little bit later. So the program ends in 1960, um, and the U.S. did consider con continuing the funding. They didn't. Uh, and it turns out that was actually a really good idea, uh, because when the U.S. cancels its funding, the program is so popular with regular Japanese that they end up petitioning their governments, the local you know, prefectural governments, to continue the program. And in fact, you get more kitchen cars, right? Because you only have 12 in, this, in, the, in the 50s, right? Um, a decade later, you have 110, right? So you have almost 10 times as many. Um, the government, uh, oh, and there's even, by the way, uh, a kitchen boat to get to the outlying islands in Nagasaki. I have yet to be able to track down a, a photograph of this. This is something that uh, I intend to do at some point. Um, but they, they are exceptionally popular and local Japanese governments are willing to fund them because they, they, they're appearing to work um, and everybody likes them. And so essentially, they, yeah, like I said, they, you, know, you go from 12 in 1960 to 110 by 1970. Um, and they continue to be popular in the 1970s, primarily in rural areas, although this is a period where you're starting to see their popularity go down um, in, uh, in urban areas uh, a little bit more quickly. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the differenti sort of differentiation uh, of um, the, the speed of economic change. But another one is uh, that in fact, the kitchen cars are almost too successful. They're little, they're kind of victims of their own success. Uh, because, and this is from an American report from the uh, late 60s, I guess it is, uh, something like that, um, where the, this American report says, you know, for urban young married couples, rice is often missing from the breakfast table. For them, it's toast, hot tea, or coffee, and often packaged breakfast cereals. Um, I think they might be off on the breakfast cereal part. But in any case, the, the tea and toast thing is, is certainly uh, true. And what's happening is that Japan is becoming, uh, as uh, the Japan Times put it, wheat conscious, which sounds kind of like it's, you know, some sort of gateway drug, um, which I think, you know, in some sense, the Americans thought of it as a gateway drug. Um, and people are eating a lot more wheat than they had, uh, you know, at any time in Japanese history. Um, and other uh, American commodities are coming along with that, including, um, you know, meat and dairy uh, and soy and corn. Um, and so what's happening is that the, the, di the, the diet is becoming much more like what the Americans want it to be in order to have that uh, rich export market. Um, and so in this sense, I, I, think that the, I think that they're a victim of their own success. Uh, that's point number two. And point number one, and this is why I said they're kind of like a TV program, is the TV ownership is going up. So after, uh, you, you probably know that in 1964, Tokyo hosts the Olympics. And what happens is that um, TV, t uh, everybody buys a TV because they want to watch the Olympics, right? And so TV ownership is skyrocketing in this decade. Uh, and it becomes much more efficient uh, and economical to take the kitchen car and put it on TV, right? Because then you can really reach everybody in their living rooms and all of the benefits of the kitchen car can be had, uh, well, most of them at least, with, with almost none of the cost. Um, so 
you know, the beginning of the end of the kitchen cars is coming in the late 70s. Um, and so, for example, in 77, uh, Tokyo drops the kitchen cars from its 78 budget. That same year, Toyama Prefecture, which is a rural prefecture, actually rolls out a brand new kitchen car. Right. So in rural areas, it's a lot slower. This sort of change is coming slower. Um, but by 1980, the sort of end is, is in sight. Um, this is uh, a still from a, a documentary actually about the, the kitchen cars. Um, and this is uh, Matsutani Mitsuko from the JNA, the Japan Nutrition Association. She was the vice chair. She was asked in 1978 about the kitchen cars. And this goes to, Will we're, we're finally getting to the answer to William's question. Um, so she described American funding as unbelievable. Uh, she said, after all, they bought us a dozen brand new buses, each costing 4 million yen. Uh, plus, they funded the driver's salaries and gasoline to the tune of 600,000 yen per month. They even made pamphlets for us. I heard it cost upward of 100 million yen over six years. However, she flatly denied that this was uh, American propaganda. There we go. Okay. Uh, she said, its goal was purely national nutrition improvement, something that everyone agreed on. Promoting wheat-based foods and nutritional improvement would naturally lead to increased wheat consumption. And because America understood this, they left operations entirely up to us. The only real condition, and here's, here's the caveat, uh, is that they had to use wheat in at least one dish for each demonstration. Nevertheless, she's pressed by the interviewer on this, and she admits that and, and, uh, the funding question is taboo, uh, even within the JNA. Um, and so, William, the answer to your question is that the higher ups, like uh, Matsutani in the Japan Nutrition Association, and Oi Sotoshio, who is the sort of originator of the program, uh, and the folks in the health ministry, they all know. They all know that it's American funded. But the audiences, uh, probably the local health officials, it's a, it's a, that's a little bit hard to tell. And, and the nutritionists themselves had no idea. Um, it was kept a secret. Now, why that is, there's no documentation for that, why that decision was made. Um, but it's part of the reason that there are so many conspiracy theories out there, right? Because, because it was a secret that this was American funded. Um, so, so yeah, uh, th there's your answer. <laughs> and we could talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Uh, but I have just one or two more slides here that I wanted to share with you. So this is, I wasn't able to find a, a, a good photograph of uh, Oiso, but this is a quote from Oiso, um, who was much clearer eyed about the whole thing than Matsutani. So he did push back on the idea that the kitchen cars were a sort of one-sided American plot to destroy the Japanese diet, right? So he's, he's been pushing back on this conspiracy theory since before it took hold. Um, he did though recognize unlike Matsutani, that, the, uh, that they were a propaganda tool. But he flips this on its head to assert that they were Japan's propaganda tool for its own purposes. Um, and so this is, so responding to uh, the same interviewer, he says, um, if anything, I think I did a great job given that I made the Americans use their money for Japan. Uh, and at first he insists that, uh, so he, said, he goes on to say, at first, uh, Richard Baum, uh, the American representative, insisted that we use the money to promote wheat. But when I told him to take the long view, to recognize that as the Japanese diet grew richer, people would naturally gravitate to wheat, he gave us the okay. So the kitchen cars, uh, in Oiso's mind, were run by and for Japan. And the fact that nobody realized they were funded by Washington is all the evidence that anyone needs to understand this, he says. Um, in other words, if it had been operated by and for American interests, American influence should have been obvious at the time. And so the fact that it wasn't uh, is how we know that it was run by and for Japan. I don't know whether you're any more or less convinced than I am. Um, two, more, two more slides here. Uh, and I want to just sort of wrap up with uh, the other side of this story, which is Richard Baum, uh, who's, who also replying to the same interviewer, uh, says, the kitchen, uh, I think the initial program of developing kitchen demonstration buses was very effective. 
uh, the kitchen demonstration buses became a very good propaganda device because they had loudspeakers and could move to the village areas. And then there would be prior advertising with the housewives uh, before the bus got there. And they would come out and gather around and learn how to make different wheat foods. And then they would get to sample the wheat foods. And they found these to be very delicious. And they would say, um, oh, no, sorry. I got my... Uh, sorry, it jumped two slides on me. Let's see if I can get that to go to the right slide. Okay, yeah. So, I, and, and uh, Baum finished up by saying, um, oh wow, now it's jumped two slides again. Sorry about this. Um, so Baum actually finishes up by saying, oishi desu, mo skoshi. In other words, uh, the, the women would all uh, at the end say, this is delicious, a little more please. Um, and so in his mind, uh, this is the real conclusion. Whereas for Oiso, um, his point is real propaganda works without anyone realizing. Uh, and so he's, again, very clear that this is definitely uh, propaganda. Uh, so I wanted to end end here uh, and get to the Q and A, and I'm sorry, I think I went a minute or two over, and part of that is because of the uh, PowerPoint, but I do apologize for that. Um, so let me unshare my screen here so I can uh, talk, take some of these questions. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking at the, the Q and A here, uh, and it looks like uh, were the American loans in yen repaid? If so, in yen. Uh, okay. So the American loans, uh, when they when they loaned back the money uh, that Japan had paid in yen, um, they were the the. The Japanese then pay back um, the money over a very, very long period in dollars. Um, but they're able to do that because the Japanese economy is developing over, and again, these are, I think, mostly 30 and 35 year loans. I, I, I'm pretty sure they were also 35 year loans, but I, I think they're mostly 30 year loans. Um, and they're one and 2% interest. And so as Japan's economy develops, paying them back is not a burden, whereas it would have been. Uh, in 1956, in 1960. So that's also an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Were there any other questions or comments here? Well, um, as others typing their questions, if you don't mind, I want I want to jump in. Um, sure. Sorry, I can't type here. Um, you know, as a co-host, there's no way I can type in in a Q and A, yeah. so I have yeah, to speak. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, it it really um, um, enlightened me uh, in a way that you know, I during my first year in Japan, um, you know, the the food I eat most is pasta, um, as well as a fried chicken. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's I think your talk, um, you know, answered kind of my, my question regarding that, right? <laughs> um, it's quite common for us to know that Japan is a nation of rice, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and, and um, you know, um, I, I was amazed by the popularity of, of Italian food um, mm -hmm. or the, the Western food in general, and also, um, you know, bread. Um, so um, I was also, uh, you know, wondering, um, a question following, um, you know, my thought is that, um, do you see, um, you know, how how big was the resistance? Um, you you have talked about Oiso, who was right. know, really enthusiastic about it, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, and and believe that this is really for Japan's own good. You know, has mm -hmm. this, um, you know, mm -hmm. um, probably unscientific idea about you know, bread mm -hmm. uh, wheat is better um, than mm -hmm. rice. So I was wondering, um, you know, um, how much the resistance was at that time. 
Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, and I think there's two ways to answer that. Um, and there's one that's sort of a general way and then one that answers that question specifically uh, in this context. So uh, it is generally quite difficult to change uh, the eating habits of individuals. Uh, and it's a little bit easier to change the eating habits of generations. Uh, and so if, you, uh, if you're part of the generation that experienced the war, <clears throat> excuse me, that experienced the war, um, these foods are new for you. And they're likely not to become part of the sort of core of your diet. But if you're part of the post-war generation of children who grew up with bread and milk as part of the core of your diet, um, it's going to be much easier to accept the constellation of foods that go with bread and milk, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, again, this is, we're talking in the, in the aggregate, we're talking in the millions of people, not in you know, any individual, right? So I can't predict what any one person would have felt about this. And this goes to the other way to answer that question. Um, which is that uh, you do have in Japan, uh, represented uh, in this presentation by Oiso, uh, an almost universal, unanimous elite buy-in. Uh, there is, though, even within Japan's elites, a really strong backlash from one sector, and that is Japan's domestic agriculture sector. Uh, where you know what they see is a threat to their livelihoods, um, and in the 70s, the reason that the Japanese school lunch changes over to rice and it is mostly rice-based now, is actually a fight between the education ministry and the agriculture ministry, uh, where the ag ministry says, "Hey, you know, like we'd actually like to feed the kids some rice," and the health and the education ministry says, "Oh my God, rice! That would be so terrible. It would be not nutritious, and we should never do that." And eventually, they come up with this like well, let's start with, like, let's start with twice a week and see how it goes, kind of compromise in, I think it's 76. Um, and it sort of, you know, goes on from there. And, and it's only after that that you start to have all of the cultural discourse about in Japan and rice uh, come back to the fore um, as a way to kind of justify this uh, agriculture ministry agenda. Um, so there is some elite infighting at that level, um, but, but it's really between sort of health and education on one side and uh, agriculture on the other. Now then you have the level of the actual consumers, um, and, and that's quite different. Um, and again, I think we can't make any assumptions about any particular individual, but in the same way that, you know, if I told you, uh, here's a voter, Right, and this voter is a um, well. Let's take take Dr. Liu, right? Uh, a you know a university professor uh, in the humanities, uh, a minority, uh, and uh, you know in their in their forties. Uh, you can you might not be able to tell exactly how he voted in the last presidential election. Right, because he's an individual. But if I had a hundred Professor Lou's, which by the way would be a great thing, um, I could probably tell who would win the election. Right. So once we stop thinking about the behavior of individuals and start thinking about the behavior of collectives over time, I think we can answer these questions about influence a lot more easily. Um, so I'm, I, I hope that answers your question, Sydney. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have two more questions uh, from Matthew sure. and William. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing this. Okay, sorry. Uh, so how uh, could the funding of kitchen cars by the U.S. to distribute wheat across Japan and Japanese people learning new culinary arts be considered a win-win for both nations? Right, so this is, this is something where um, I think, again, uh, short-term versus long-term is maybe the way to think about this. Um, Japan desperately needed the help. Um, you know, the situation was quite dire, uh, you know, in, in, even into the mid fifties, um, you know, the economy is getting better, but it's mostly getting better in the cities. Uh, and it's not until the sixties that things are really getting better all over the place. And part of that has to do with American food aid. Uh, you know, the U S is 
essentially dumping cheap surplus, right? Because you're not going to, you don't want to sell it on the American market because then it's going to drive down prices on the American market. So you turned it into a tool of foreign policy to help Japan and other countries, by the way, um, India, Pakistan, whatever, uh, to, to recover. Um, and this is, again, it's a win-win in that limited context in which it was conceived. And so the, the folks who look at this as an American plot to destroy the Japanese traditional diet are essentially accusing people in the 1950s of not understanding the implications of their policy for 2020. Um, and I got to admit, I'm not sure that's a fair way to think about it. Uh, I don't want to be held res you know, responsible for the implications of my, po of my decisions now 70, 80 years in the future, right? In terms of you know, foreign policy and stuff like that. Right? So certainly as an individual, yes, I should be held responsible, right? But in terms of designing systems, the systems that we designed in the 50s, of course they don't work in 2020, right? But we designed them in the 50s. And you have to see them in that context. And in that context, yes, I think in a limited way, they were a win-win. Uh, I think this is also probably not something on which everyone would agree with me. Uh, so yeah, I'm aware of that. <laughs> um, and how enduring has the impact of the food uh, truck program been even today? Um, yeah, so this is, I think uh, Dr. Liu was speaking to this a little bit where you have um, you know, a, a Japanese food landscape, let's call it that, a foodscape, uh, which is extremely diverse and eclectic. Um, you know, I live in a city of something like two and a half million people, um, which is a big city, you know, don't get me wrong, but I can get anything, I, you know, get anything uh, from pretty much anywhere in the world. I, you know, I, there's, I can go out to Indian and Indian or Hawaiian or I'm just thinking like the things in my neighborhood that I can walk to. There's Indian, there's Hawaiian, there's Thai, there's Vietnamese, there's, uh, you know, there, of course, there's ramen and Japanese restaurants or whatever. Um, and I can go to the supermarket and I can buy, you know, food from all over the world. And people do, right? Uh, the Japanese diet has become in incredibly eclectic. Uh, and some of that definitely has to do with the introduction, um, both of the food truck program, yes, um, and in parallel with that, the school lunch program, right? So that teaching children to enjoy these tastes early on is very important because then they become lifelong consumers. And the food truck program is really a more limited thing to influence uh, the generation that hadn't grown up in the school lunch program, right? It's the mothers of that first generation of school lunchers that are really the target here. Um, and so as that generational change happens um, and the mothers making who are making the food, and again, it is mostly mothers, so I'm just short shorthanding here. Um, one, when they've already come up eating these foods in the school lunch program, um, and in other places, that they're going to sort of naturally make those foods for their own children, right? So it's kind of a more limited time approach, whereas the school, the school lunch program has a much sort of longer shelf life in that sense. Okay, uh, great. I'm afraid this is also the final question uh, mm -hmm. because of the time. Um, so uh, please join me and thank Dr. Hobson again for this uh, wonderful talk. Um, it's really illuminating for me. Um, I hope uh, for everyone as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much. It was a real privilege. And it was, I just want to say it was, a, it was a privilege to be asked to talk and also to have such fantastic questions. Uh, Sydney, you're, you're very lucky to have such great students. Uh, and thank, thank you all. You. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so um, I'm afraid I have to shut down the platform. Um, thanks again, Nathan. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.